Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you our layout tour uh, host for tonight, Craig Brantley. Craig is a native Texan who grew up in the Houston area. His interest in model trains has sp spanned his entire life. Craig's grandparents lived three houses from the Houston Belt and Terminal Railroad tracks where he watched the trains pass. His mother says that his first word was train. Craig's parents had no interest in model trains, but purchased an 8 by 16 Lionel layout before he was two years of age because Craig liked trains. In 2015, Craig, along with Eddie Carroll and Chuck Lind, were the co-chairman for the National Narrow Gauge Convention held in Houston. Craig's layout was on the tour with over 400 guests visiting during the convention. Tonight, Craig will give us a tour of his Denver and Rio Grande Western Spring Division O-ON3 layout and provide some tips on designing for operation and planning scenes. So take it away, Craig. All right, well, uh, thank you for inviting me to share my layout. Um, it's been a long, long uh, journey. Um, so tonight I would like to share uh, a tour of my layout as well as some uh, things I've learned on planning for operation and for planning scenes. <clears throat> First of all, a little bit of my background uh, on how my modeling interest evolved. Uh, my first exposure to narrow gauge was at Gil Freitag's HO, HON3, Stony Creek and Western layout in 1972. Um, Gil was kind enough to explain narrow gauge in Colorado to me, and uh, <clears throat> over the years, Gil and Virginia um, were basically surrogate par parents to a lot of us uh, young modelers, and they've been great ambassadors to the hobby. Um, John, Gil was the uh, John Allen of Texas, and his track work and scenery were uh, so far ahead of everybody else. Uh, the Freitag's layout was open uh, every Thanksgiving for 50 or four years. Uh, but sadly, uh, Gill in Virginia passed away last year, <clears throat> and the Stony Creek and Western has been dis dismantled. But um, Gill and his uh, Gill will live on because most of the structures were given to his friends, and now they occupy a lot of layouts all over the country. They were great people. So, um, I was 13 years old when I visited Gill's layout and was building a Santa Fe in scale layout. And after my visit, my mom took me to the public library and I checked out a new book out called The Silver Sand One by Mallory Farrell. <clears throat> uh, seeing Gill's layout and reading about the RGS hooked me on narrow gauge. And in 1975, uh, the in scale was sold and my parents purchased me a HON3 brass. West Side Models Piston Valve K27. So by 1995, I had constructed a couple of small modular HON3 layouts and amassed a large collection of uh, HON3 uh, brass and rolling stock and uh, was planning my empire for our new home. And uh, just before we moved, Barry Bogues uh, said, uh, hey, if you're ever going to switch scales, now's the time to do it. So in 1976, uh, Barry and I constructed an ON3 modular switching layout with two PFM sound systems. I'm sure y'all, many of y'all remember those to try out the new scale. Uh, this is the switching layout here. Uh, this is Barry Bogues, and this is my mug back here in the background. I think we were about 38, probably when that happened, 38, 39. We were under 40 years old, so still wet behind the ears. So in 1997, I rounded up a, a group of um, prominent modelers in the Houston area, and we built a sectional 0-3 layout to take to train shows. Uh, the, the layout was a huge hit and really exposed 0-3 to local modelers. Um, this is a couple of pictures uh, the year 2000. Uh, we took it to a train show. Uh, this picture of this Shea here is uh, by Jim Barron. Uh, I believe it won the the uh, gear locomotives in the National Narrow Gauge Convention one year. I don't remember which year it was. 
So <clears throat> I was pretty much uh, hooked on uh, ON3. And so I sold off 35 HON3 locomotives and 80 cars I had built and painted and was all in an O scale. So my HON3 Empire, which uh, Empire room I was building, was cut in half by moving to ON3. So how, how can I fit the DNRGW into this space? Well, you can't. <laughs> so uh, uh, that, that's the grim reality. So my layout is uh, built in what we call a Texas basement because we don't have basements in Texas. It's, uh, it's a room over the garage. Uh, the room is uh, 21 by 32 feet. Uh, it's basically a three car, extended three car garage. Track height is somewhere between 48 inches and 58 inches. Minimum radius is 42 inches for the narrow gauge and 48 inches for the standard gauge. I also have a minimum, a maximum grade of two and a half percent. I'm a firm believer of double heading because I like the way it looks, not because I have to. Um, the layout uh, structure is built of uh, what's called stud wall bench work. Uh, Lowell Joyner, uh, prominent O scaler in San Antonio, uh, he started all this. He was an architect and uh, he started this. And then Chuck Lynn was building his layout this way. And I thought it was a good idea. It looked good. It was cheaper than uh, one by fours and doing the L girder. And so I built everything out of two by fours. All the uh, switches uh, on the layout are uh, hand built code 100, flex track, uh, PSC flex track. Uh, and I have uh, quite a bit of dual gauge, uh, about 13 dual gauge switches on the layout. Uh, OW5, not P48. <clears throat> and uh, I run uh, wireless easy DCC uh, throttles with uh, all DCC sound and all of the locomotives. And then we do operating sessions. I use rail op switch list. Uh, rail op is a, uh, has been defunct for a few years, but it still works well for me. So I don't see any needs to change right now. And then if you really want to get carried away on designing your layout, well, you can build a model of it. So I built this model when we were building the modular layout or the sectional layout, primarily because uh, I had a lot of spare time and my room was being occupied by that modular layout. And um, the nice thing about the model was it it allowed everybody to see what my vision was, number one, but it also allowed me to plan uh, the structure. And uh, I made several design changes after I built the model uh, based on, based on some, some issues that I found with the model. <clears throat> so here's my track plan. Um, looks a little convoluted, it is. Um, it's a freelance uh, DNRGW, equipment and structures. Um, my era is from 1940 to 1950. I started out in 1940 because the Bug Herald and the Flying Grand were used at the same time, but the Bumblebee 268 and the California Zephyr kind of put me into the early 50s. The entire layout I designed on AutoCAD software. I used to manage a CAD department and I'm proficient in AutoCAD. And, and so I, I, I drew everything up in AutoCAD primarily because uh, everything works on paper and, and you can't really cheat with, with CAD. The uh, layout features a point-to-point -point operation with balloon loops on each end. Uh, you can see here that there is a, uh, this blue here is the uh, dual gauge that runs basically a loop around the room, a dual gauge yard. And you come around up to uh, Stony Creek named after Gil Freitag's layout, around to Chama Valley up to Midway, to Rio Chama, to Mears Junction, over the High Line, and then into Spring, which is the terminating uh, end of the route. And there, uh, typically in operating sessions, you turn your locomotive and go back, back the other direction. But uh, I have the balloon loop for, basically for open houses in the San Juan to turn it around. Uh, you'll notice I don't have any duck unders on the layout. I'm a, I hate duck unders, so uh, I designed the layout that you walk into it. There's three tracks that hug the stairwell <clears throat> that keep uh, allow you to walk into the layout and flow through the layout. 
And uh, the only lift bridge I have is in, uh, is in my restroom where I have a lift bridge to be able to use the sink. So approximately 275 feet in narrow gauge main line, uh, which is uh, the blue, part of the blue and the red lines you see here, uh, that only works out to about two and a half scale miles. So I had to be creative to make the layout seem larger than it is. So the room is divided into six areas. Uh, with a divider wall that runs down the middle of the room, which allows the, uh, the room to, to seem larger because you can't see the entire layout at one time. So let's take a tour of the railroad. <clears throat> this is what you see when you uh, arrive at my home. Um, again, my, my layout is above the garage. My wife had this sign made for me a few years ago. And when you're standing at the bottom of the staircase, this is what you see. So one of the things, one of my primary design considerations was this scene right here. I wanted you to walk up through the stairs and be way below the trains and be able to feel like you're down in the canyon. And uh, this, this scene achieved it. It's another view with a wide angle lens to kind of give you more of a, a feel of the effect. So once you get to the top of the stairs, most people stop and you kind of have their mouth open, but uh, I try to coax them on into the layout. But this is what you see um, on the right here is Stony Creek. This is Midway. And then this track here goes down to Antonito, which is my staging yard. And then this is the high line that goes over to Spring, which is on the back wall here. So here we have a passenger special, photo special. It's coming out of Durango. Again, this train is about 1951-52, uh, entering their uh, train sitting on siding in, in Stony Creek. Another view of Stony Creek. You notice the yellow marks on the track here. <clears throat> These are clearance marks. So when you park your train, you know that you're, you're clear of the siding. Another view of Stony Creek. We've got Bob here talking to the local sheriff. So this is Durango. Durango is not finished, but it's a uh, work in progress. But you can see that we have uh, three track railroad here, so it's dual gauge uh, line through town. Here's a little view of the roster of the railroad. Um, I do have a, a roundhouse, um, but we have been planning to move for a while and uh, it occupies a four foot square uh, area and I couldn't figure out how to get it out of the room without turning it sideways. So I decided that I wasn't going to build the, the roundhouse until we move. <clears throat> so there it is. It's uh, just uh, tracks and turntable. Turntable is a modified um, Walther's turntable, HO turntable. It's a 120 foot uh, turntable, which is 65 foot and O scale. 130 foot, excuse me, turntable. So this is one of the reasons I did dual gauge. Um, this is a view of uh, uh, L105, uh, 2662, and, um, and the RGS number 20. And you really get the, the diminutive size of narrow gauge here. Uh, one of the things I is a challenge when HO and N-scale visitors come over is uh, ON3 looks like it's very large, but when you put it up against an actual O standard gauge train, uh, you can see that it, they're really tiny. I also have a California Zephyr. Uh, originally, the standard gauge is really to give a scale comparison, but over the years, I've collected a, a, a lot of standard gauge equipment. Uh, this California Zephyr is 25 feet long in O scale. So um, it basically is the full length of one side of my room. Here's another shot of it working its way around. 
So here's something you'll see in a lot of layouts, and that's uh, an error gauge locomotive switching around standard gauge cars. And here you can really see the difference between this Northern Pacific reefer and the uh, narrow gauge uh, DNRGW reefer. So one of the things I wanted to do is have a good interchange between the standard gauge and the narrow gauge. So there's several businesses in Durango that do an interchange, even though that's not prototypical, but uh, it's my railroad. Um, so here we have the uh, cattle pen and I have standard gauge uh, tracks on the outside and narrow gauge on the inside so they can do exchanges here. Uh, this is a mirror back here in the background to uh, give the illusion that it's a, a lot bigger area than it is. So this is uh, Rio Chama, or excuse me, Chama Valley. It's a little sleepy town, but uh, have a uh, place called Gigi's Palace there. And uh, one of my childhood friend's wife, his name's Gigi, and for some reason, she wanted a brothel on my layout. So that's her That's her place. This is a shot of uh, Rio Chama. Um, again, it's a switching area, basically. Um, I had a lot of extra space that I couldn't really use for switching. So I built the town into a, into a um, basically a valley. Another shot in uh, Rio Chama. Here we have the San Juan arriving in Rio Chama. And then up a little higher on the line, this is the high line, the highest bridge on the railroads, 58 inches. Here we have uh, 346 and a freight train crossing, little computer enhancing there. Of course, it's the uh, first snow of the year. It's about October. And uh, so they had uh, light snows. They had to bring the rotary out to, uh, to clear the line. And down on the lower level, this is a L1031, uh, L excuse me, uh, 2882, that's uh, bringing a big freight through to Durango. So up in spring, um, this is at the uh, Hope for Gold Mine. Uh, did a little switching going on there. And here we have the San Juan. Uh, leaving uh, spring, heading downhill. San Juan traversing the freshly plowed snow. Going over the high bridge. And then headed down to Antonito. So that was a quick tour of the railroad. Um, talk a little bit about uh, designing for operation. First thing I said earlier is everything works on paper. So uh, you gotta watch out for that. Uh, people have a bad habit of bending radiuses to make things work. Number one, you never have enough staging room, no matter what you have. You need to vary your industry type. So if you like, uh, oil tankers, you need to have places for the oil tankers to go, as well as stock cars, reefers, et cetera. Uh, box cars and, <coughs> excuse me, flat cars can pretty much go anywhere. And you never have enough uh, car locations. You need to make sure you have plenty of passing sightings and runarounds. Minimize hidden track. I didn't do that on this layout. Have an operating session. Um, you'll find your problem very quickly when you have an operating session. Consult your friends. Uh, your friends are have a lot of experience and they have good ideas sometimes. And then don't be afraid to change your plan. Um, you know, everything's not set in stone. Don't be afraid to change it as well as improve your plan as you build it. So let me show you a few things uh, about my railroad and things that I've done. Um, first thing I built on the railroad was the staging yard because it's 
underneath everything else. And at the time, I thought this is enough tracks. There's five st five storage tracks there <clears throat> because I had a San Juan and a tank car train and a stock car train and a rotary. And you know, I figured that's enough room to store everything. Well, it's enough to store everything. But when you start operating, um, you don't have any room because you have to eliminate those trains because you need to have cars you can switch on the layout. So this is a, a brown paper for temporary scenery. This is a, a longtime friend of mine uh, who's passed away now, Jim Lingenfelter. Uh, he was an architect here in Houston, and this is his HON3 layout. And he covered everything with uh, brown paper. Number one, just kind of give the illusion of, of the mountains before he actually built them. So I, I plagiarized them and, uh, and, and copied it. <clears throat> the other nice thing about the brown paper is it's a good uh, under underlayment for when you put the hydrocal on. It uh, it supports the hydrocal very well. I'm a big proponent of mark mock excuse me of mock ups. Uh, these are basically uh, cut out plans on glued onto onto uh, foam board. Um, I've used these two models and for the last 20 years in presentations and on other people's layouts to uh, to work out their uh, their structures on their layout. <clears throat> so one of the things that I did on this particular situation, I had the the coal chute on the on the visible side. But as I started looking at it and and also planning being able to switch, there's no switching going on on the on the on the tipple side, so the the loading or unloading side is is far more interesting. And also, I needed to be able to reach the the uh, drop gone to be able to uncouple it. And then this is the final scene. There's another mock-up of the Durango Depot. Um, I didn't want to give up the amount of space that the width of the Durango Depot took up, so I decided to basically cut it in half. I um, I cut it behind the ridge in order so it doesn't sit flat up against the back wall. Here's the uh, the frame of the building uh, before I put it together, and then this is the finished station. As you can see, it still gives the effect of the full-size depot. You don't really notice that, that it's missing part of it. So this is Stony Creek, and uh, Stony Creek started out as an idea. And one of the things that I, I uh, do is to, on developing switching plans is, is I use paper doll switches. And these are basically Xerox copies of uh, switch templates that are glued to a uh, poster board. Uh, both left and right hands. I have dual gauge. Uh, when you get into dual gauge, the third rail is so tricky. You have to have uh, paper dolls or you'll start laying the switch incorrectly. But I started with the town and started laying out how I wanted the switching to go in this town. And then this is uh, a little further along. And then this is the final arrangement. I have a mill up here. This is a team track, station track. It's a bit of a switching puzzle because you can only fit one locomotive and one car on this uh, on this spur here. So this is what it looks like um, after the brand paper has been put in place. Uh, got the rock castings in, some of the ground cover, tracks been painted. So another thing that I like to do is the um, is I place my structures and I push the dirt up around the, the edges of the structures. And then when I remove them, I wet it all down and let it and glue it down. And then uh, when I put the structure back in place, it looks like it's been there forever. So this is the finished scene. I've since added a platform for this station, but at this time, it was just uh, in the dirt. So there's another thing to look out for. I'm six foot tall, so reaching two foot across a layout is no real challenge for me, but I do have friends that are a little more vertically challenged. 
<clears throat> so you can see right here that that uh, he's having a little difficulty uh, uncoupling a car, even though it's only about two foot away from him. The um, the you can see the cross bucks here. Those have been broken off so many times now that I I just remove them when we have operating sessions because I know they're going to get busted off. Here's Chuck Lynn uh, operating at the layout. Um, another one of my things I, I try to achieve is not having control panels that are easy to catch clothing on or or fingers to accidentally switch trains and stuff like that. So all of my uh, control panels are recessed. And uh, this is basically just a, a five by eight um Michael's wooden frame that I screwed a piece of masonite to and and did a uh, basically a, a photo rendering on the switch on the um, on the diagram and then uh, it's on a hinge on the bottom of it so I can fold it out and, and do work on the switches as well as do the installation of the wiring. But it keeps people from accidentally, bumping into switches or tearing switches off. I've seen that happen before on layouts also. So this is another area. This is Hope, Hope the Hope for Gold Mine. It's in, uh, in spring. And so this is the first mock-up. Uh, it's basically a Bill, Man Bill Banta Cimarron mine kit. <clears throat> I visited John Kalin's uh, SN3 layout. Uh, many years ago, and and he took this kid and basically turned it into a mine and a mill. And I really liked that because it it gave more uh, opportunity <clears throat> for operating because now I can put box cars, flat cars, as well as gondolas at this particular industry. So I had to do a little scenery modification here. This is the rough layout of the buildings. You, did it. you see some of the rock work's been done. And then this is uh, had the ground cover put in and the bushes and the um, the abutments here for the for the um, for the tipple. And then this is everything put together. And this is the final scene number 20 uh, switching a flat car here. Another area of the no luck mine. Um, this is what it started out as just a spur. Here's a mock up, which was again part of the Panta kit. But I found a company called Kitwood <clears throat> Hill, or excuse me, Kitwood Hill Models over in the UK. And uh, they did a tipple and they also had a little mining industry. <clears throat> so I uh, decided to kit bash that and put it together um, as one industry. Again, it allows me to have uh, gondolas here and flat cars and box cars at the at the mining supply company. This is where the scenery I cut out. You can see I did a little blasting up here to put a porthole for the mine, built a retaining wall behind it. This is after everything's been laid in. You notice there's a there's a outhouse out here at the end of track here. And then this is the finished scene. Again, I can put flat cars, gondolas, box cars here. This is what happens when you have too much hidden track. I um this was taken at the narrow gauge convention. Uh, some guests walked up the stairs. And someone had derailed the train deep in the bowels of my layout, which the only way to get there is to contort yourself. And they said, hey, where are you? And I said, right here. And I stuck my hand out and somebody took a picture of it. So <clears throat> all these years of uh, working on my railroad, I got to really thank my, my parents, John and Carol Brantley, um, you know, they, they stood behind me and, and allowed me to pursue my hobby through my whole life, uh, always there for me. 
Of course, none of this would be possible without my lovely wife, Laurie, uh, without her tolerance and support, uh, none of this would have been possible. Uh, Barry and Blake Bogues. Uh, Barry is an uh, expert in electronics, an uh, awesome scratch builder in G-Scale. And Blake is uh, really good at the DCC and um, decoding locomotives. And Travis Glass, who's done all, several of the structures on my layout, he does really fabulous work and really appreciated him. He helped me a lot uh, for, to prepare for the narrow gauge convention. And then Fro Froland Mark, um, he does the website and also he's uh, my rail op expert. Um, he's, he's done a lot of uh, switch lists for me over the years and, and uh, he's, a, he's a real brain at the, uh, at the rail op. <clears throat> of course, many open house crews. I've had so many people um, uh, help me over the years. I usually have two to three people running trains while I do the open house and I can talk to people and uh, very appreciative of everybody that's helped me there. <clears throat> um, you can visit my layout on my website. It's uh, dnrgw-sd, that's dnrgw-springdivision.com. If you search my name on YouTube, there's quite a few um, YouTube videos out there of my layout. I also have a YouTube channel that has a few few videos on it. And my layout was featured in the November 2021 Trackside Model Railroading um, magazine. I don't know if y'all subscribe to it. But they do a lot of narrow gauge. And uh, um, they came down uh, in 21 and, and, and filmed and videoed, or excuse me, filmed and and, and photoed uh, about 10 layouts here in the Houston area. About half of them have been in the magazine so far. So this is my legacy here. <clears throat> this is uh, Brantley, uh, my grandson, he's three years old, already, already a proficient uh, operator. Uh, he loves Gramps trains. Uh, they call me Gramps after the Gramps tank cars. I've made them both t-shirts that says Gramps on it with a Gramps tank car. And then that's Walker on the right. He's uh, he's 18 months old and he's just kind of getting interested in it. So what's next? <clears throat> well, um, we plan on building a new home after we hosted the narrow gauge convention in 2015, but unfortunately life and COVID kind of delayed us. So uh, we are now building a new home and it will have an 1800 square foot train house. And uh, some of y'all might think that's gigantic, but in O scale, believe it or not, that's still small. So stay tuned for a new layout starting in 19, or excuse me, in 2024. The main thing you got to remember this hobby is to have fun. That's that's the whole objective of this hobby. So thank you for letting me uh, present my layout. Thanks, Craig. Outstanding. Great presentation. So, Craig, if you would uh, stop share, and then I've got a couple of comments, questions. Uh, real quickly from Jim Brown uh, up across the border, he says, absolutely stunning scenery. Um, David Woodhead, again, another Canadian. What did you use for the snow scenes? Looks great. Okay, well, the snow is basically two Woodland Scenics products. It's a... Um, um, well, I can't think of the name of it, but the snow is the, the product snow is kind of sprinkled on top to uh, give it a little sparkle, but it's a um, flex paste is the name of it. Flex paste is what the uh, base is, and, and it's basically been dry brushed uh, on uh, on the rocks to uh, to give it the illusion of, of, of snow. Um, I will tell people... Um, I hadn't originally had snow on there, but I had a rotary snow plow, no work for it to do anything. So I put the snow in later and uh, I'd already ballasted the track. So if you plan on doing snow, snow do not ballast your track. <laughs> it's a nightmare to try to put the snow down. So don't ballast your track. All right. And then another question from Ron Gutman. What is behind the brown paper? What supports it? Okay. Originally, it's uh, basically a lattice work of... Uh, of cardboard strips that are hot, hot glued together to give you a frame. And then the uh, brown paper is, is hot glued to that. Um, I've since switched over to uh, uh, fiberglass mesh, which is a 
uh, a product used for uh, EFAS, uh, which is a, basically a, a faux stucco that they use on commercial buildings and stuff. Uh, Eddie Carroll turned me on to that. So I pretty much use that as the base now. Uh, and the framework is made out of uh, foam board, inch thick foam, foam board to give the uh, profile. And then the lat or the uh, the fiberglass mesh is is then uh, uh, affixed to that, and then the hydrocal cloth goes on top of that. Very good. From Mike McCarville, he says, "I love the Gramps legacy." Then from um, uh, Edgewood, uh, Robert Kerr Edgewood, great layout. Thank you for sharing, Craig. Jim Brown again, great presentation. Thanks for sharing uh, all. Then uh, if you look in chat, folks, Mike McCarville has provided the answer on the Woodland Scenics uh, Soft Flake Snow. Um, then Bill Hobbs uh, up in Little Rock says the entrance scene is the first thing that always comes to mind when thinking of this layout. And I will tell you, Bill is correct. When you walk up those stairs, it is just breathtaking. Uh, then Dave Woodhead again says, thanks, Craig. So uh, any other questions or comments for Craig before we uh, move on? And one of the things that I can advise you on, on the making it look like fresh plowed snow is I made a, a template, basically a track gauge, and I drug that material right along the top of the track. And, uh, and I had it low enough to where I could clean the track, number one, and it didn't foul any of the, any of the flanges. So it's, it's got a little a little uh, groove on it that allows it to clear out around the flanges. Very good. 